our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did what, what, fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And you're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We're with you live from 1 until 3 on this Good Friday. Now, coming up this afternoon, Westminster City Hall scrambles to create an Easter display following complaints it had simply forgotten about the Christian holiday. Uh, meanwhile, rain is on the ropes. The deputy Labour leader is under pressure as police and council officials say they will review again whether she committed tax and electoral fraud. And Thames Water in hot water. The water company serving a quarter of the UK's population is fighting against nationalisation as its shareholders demand customer bills a height by a whopping 40%. All of that's coming up, but first, let's get the news headlines with Nadira Tudor. Good afternoon. The Prime Minister has come under fire for giving a major Tory donor a knighthood. Mohammed Mansour, a businessman and a senior treasurer for the party, was honoured for his business, charity and political service. Last year, he gave £5 million, which is one of the biggest donations to the Conservatives in decades. Meanwhile, pressure is mounting on Labour's Angela Rayner in the ongoing tax row over the sale of her council house. The deputy Labour leader says she's confident she hasn't broken any rules. Party chair Annalise Dodds agrees. I've got complete confidence in her. And, you know, really, I think we need to ask the question, why are we seeing this petty politicking coming from the Conservatives? You know, I know that rather than talking about the finances of one individual, many people watching this will be saying, well, hang on, why aren't politicians talking about family finances? Journalists here at News UK are showing support for their colleague journalist Evan Gershkovich. The 32-year-old has now been detained illegally by Russia for one year. He's being held on spying charges, despite there being no evidence provided to date. The US describes him as wrongfully jailed. An eight-year-old girl is the sole survivor of a bus crash in South Africa which claimed 45 lives. Authorities are investigating what caused the vehicle to plunge 50 metres off a bridge and burst into flames. It was taking pilgrims from Botswana's capital to an Easter service. On the roads, drivers are warned to expect long delays for this Easter getaway. More than 14 million trips are expected and at least three major airports say they're expecting this to be their busiest Easter weekend on record. Finally, we're not expecting to see Kate Middleton at this Easter while she's being treated for cancer. But King Charles is expected to make an appearance at Windsor Castle's Easter Sunday service. Royal commentator Michael Cole told Talk Today it's hugely important to him. It means a lot to him. He is a man of faith um, and Easter is arguably a more significant and more important date in the Christian calendar even than Christmas. Uh, and he's determined to be there, and the Queen will be there with him. That's your news now. Here's the weather with Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello again. There will be some tricky driving conditions today because of the weather. Again, heavy showers and thunderstorms, some hail thrown in as well. You can just see the showery nature of the weather. There will be some gaps in between the showers there with a little bit of sunshine. But I think for many, it's just one of those days, really. Lots of showers, particularly heavy this afternoon through northern parts of England and up into Scotland, Northern Ireland as well. It could well just turn a bit drier across more southern areas to end the day, thankfully. And temperatures will reach around 12 or 13 degrees, a little bit up on yesterday's. And not as windy either.
Now, as we head through this evening and tonight, well, there will be some drier conditions developing across many central and eastern parts of England and Wales. Still for Scotland and Northern Ireland, some showers. But uh, under the clearer skies here, it will turn a little chilly, the odd pocket of frost. And I think we'll see some mist and fog forming later in the night as well. So temperatures in towns and cities holding up near a five or six degrees, but still a bit chilly. Out there first thing in the morning, though, quite optimistic for some sunshine. I think the showers on Saturday are more likely to be across Scotland and Northern Ireland, where it will be quite uh, breezy, but elsewhere, nice in the sunshine, that's for sure. And uh, it could well be that we see temperatures climbing to 12 to maybe even 14 or 15 mid-afternoon. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome to the show. We have lots coming up over the next few hours, including Westminster City Council's embarrassing scramble to sort out an Easter display following complaints they'd forgotten it was the Christian holiday. Labour Deputy Leader Angela Rayner's property dealings are under the spotlight as her local authority and police reconsider her case and Thames Water flounders in the red. Its shareholders demand customer bills rise by 40% to save the supplier. Uh, we have some breaking news now for you as well. Leader of the Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson MP, has stepped down from his position with immediate effect. Donaldson has written a letter to the party chairman confirming that he has been charged with allegations of an historical nature. In accordance with the party rules, the party officers have suspended Donaldson from membership pending the outcome of a judicial process. The party officers this morning unanimously appointed Gavin Robinson MP as the interim party leader. And today in the studio, we're joined by former Labour advisor Matthew Laza. Thanks for coming along, Matthew. Uh, well, listen, uh, we'll keep you updated with the Donaldson story throughout, but at this stage, uh, we only know the basic details, uh, but uh, clearly something serious is going on there. Uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, whatever did happen to Easter, everybody? It's a good question. And uh, certainly uh, my Labour friends in Westminster have got egg on their face, uh, 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 as it were. That, that was a joke. I mean, uh, Yay! Um, <laughs> Um, uh, you should have said Easter egg. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. You can see why I'm not a comedian. Yeah. Um, uh, I think you're quite funny, but not in a good oh, way. Oh, right, sorry, um, go sorry. So, back, so they've got Easter egg on their face uh, uh, over the um, uh, for seemingly forgetting uh, it's Easter. And it's a reminder, really, uh, uh, to the left, of, you know, that they, uh, they because what they did is they put Ramadan messages up and then uh, they didn't replace them with Easter until 5.30 yesterday afternoon when most, most, most of the commuters in Whitehall had gone home for the Easter week and so never actually saw it. So it's a reminder to the left to uh, to remember that they uh, need to celebrate uh, all festivals. Yeah, all that's it. I've got nothing against celebrating yeah. Ramadan. Not, nothing against uh, it being celebrated around the country. We've got supermarkets saying, are you stocking up for Ramadan? Uh, why don't they say, are you stocking up for Ramadan and Easter? Why is it that Oxford Street and Regent Street right now are festooned with uh, celebratory lights uh, only celebrating well, Ramadan? The reason, what is that about? Well, that that, that's interesting because they're being paid for by a private individual, oh, no, it, which, is, which, is, which is which is which is which is weird. That if they, if they can't afford to do both, uh, or, or you know they can't find a matching donor, then they clearly shouldn't do it. But this this display, which is literally just a display in in the window of the city hall in Westminster, it's just dark. No, do you know what? I, I do have a problem with this. I do, and I will say it again. I and I've too, said Alex. it before. What I have a problem with this is a Christian country. Now, that doesn't obligate you to believe in God. That doesn't obligate you to go to church. Our monarch, our head of state, is also the head of the Church of England. We have had a Christian heritage for two millennia now, and it is the fundamentals upon which our democracy is built, upon which our social structures built, upon which our cultural and social mores are built, and in many respects, our morality. So whether or not you worship or not, Christianity has played a massive role in this country, in its traditions, and is very much even still an invisible glue that binds people together. Now, the problem I have is I don't mind people having whatever religion they want, practice it privately. But what I do have a problem with is this constant erosion, dilution, and not just that, actually a kicking constantly yeah. in the shins of our heritage, 
of our culture. Now, people can say what they like about Christianity, open season, say what you like, because that's in Christianity. You turn the other cheek, you don't get upset. But what I'm seeing increasingly is Christianity being picked on, being minimalized, being forced out, and instead we're ushering in at a rate of knots and glorifying a religion and a culture that comes with that religion, which has nothing to do with this country and its history. And in many respects, what people are doing is cultural vandalism. They're replacing what has worked for us and what is ours for two millennia with something brand new. And that, I think, is absolutely an abrogation of duty. Matthew, it is cultural we vandalism. Yeah, I, <laughs> Let's go for a drink. Absolutely. Uh, no, seriously, yeah. I, I hear you. Once it's done, you can't turn Here's the clock back thing. again. It's it, done. OK, so I don't really care about the religious aspect, but this is not a secular state. This is... Uh, the official religion of this country is the Church of England, which is a Christian church, and I can't understand why Easter, traditional British Easter, seems to be taking a serious second place to Ramadan. I don't get it. I don't understand it. By all means, celebrate Ramadan, Ramadan but celebrate Easter as well. Why, why, why are we getting rid of Easter? It seems ridiculous. Well, I'm going to speak up for a group that may be seen as woke, but actually at least are even-handed, which is the National Secular Society, who have been leading the charge, actually, um, uh, and obviously, you know, they don't want Christianity too much in public life, although they accept at the moment that it's the, the, the national religion. But they were the ones who pounced when this uh, Quran verse was put up. I think it was a voice from the Quran. It was certainly an Islamic message was put up on the departure board at King's Cross mm. Station, which you wouldn't have at mm. Easter or Christmas. You might get Happy Christmas or, you know, uh, actually a good Friday. Oh, happy holidays happy these days. Or happy holi but, not so so the at, least, at least they are, um, uh, you, know, you know, sometimes it seems that uh, most of the left are sort of embarrassed. So, so on people That's on Right. Who, who would never go near a church, uh, 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 you know, but feel they have to say yes to this. And my view is we have... Well, look, the Church of England, the old joke about it is it doesn't, it's, a church, it's our national religion but doesn't believe in God. You know, it's not the most um, didactic of churches. It's a yeah. kind of gentle, very British, you might say, um, uh, faith. Um, and therefore, we kind of have this kind of acceptance. We have a national church, but religion plays a kind of gentle role in our life. And I think that we're at a, break, a tipping point, really, where um, it seems that that's being sort of pushed out yeah. and yeah. a different sort of... Uh, um, well, uh, we want to hear from you, by yeah. the way. Uh, we're asking today, whatever happened to traditional British Easter? Give us a call on 0344 499 uh, You can uh, text us, uh, write talk at the beginning of your message and send it to 87222, or you can tweet us on x at Talk TV. Well, back to the breaking news story now. Leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, has stepped down from his position with immediate effect. Donaldson has written a letter to the party chairman confirming that he has been charged with allegations of an historical sexual offence. Well, we can speak now to Talk TV chief political commentator Peter Cardwell. Peter, those of us who are sort of news hounds heard murmurings of this a couple of hours ago when it started breaking on social media and in WhatsApp groups. What can you tell us at this stage? This is an absolutely catastrophic uh, series of events for the Democratic Unionist Party, for uh, politics in Northern Ireland, and of course, for Geoffrey Donaldson personally. Uh, he's been an MP for Lagan Valley since the, uh, for the, for the DUP, uh, since he left the Ulster Unionist Party in the early 2000s. And of course, he has now been charged with these offences, so we need to be careful about what we say about their historic uh, sexual offences. We know that. What we also know is that he is no longer leader of the Democratic Unionist Party. His deputy, Gavin Robinson, who's also a member of Parliament, is now the leader. Uh, certainly there has been a, a lot of uh, intimidation, threats, uh, opposition to Jeffrey Donaldson for a, a number of uh, months now because of his decision with the with, after the Windsor framework, that deal on the European, on the European Union, to go forward and to go back into uh, devolved government in Northern Ireland, which was suspended for two years. And there will, of course, be some sort of of uh, speculation at least, although we must be careful because this is now a matter which has been charged uh, in regard to the origins of this. But of course, the PSNI, the Police Service for Northern Ireland, will have gathered their evidence. This is a political disaster for the DUP. Geoffrey Donaldson is someone who has taken a huge leap of faith to go into devolved government with Sinn Féin. Uh, for the last 25 years since the Belfast Agreement, there has been all sorts of off again, on again, devolution within Northern Ireland. But Geoffrey Donaldson, who was an Ulster Unionist, previously part of David Trimble's party, walked out on the eve of the signing of the 1998 Belfast Agreement and then eventually joined the Democratic Unionist Party, of which he became leader a few years ago. After Arlene Foster, uh, this is 
uh, a real shock, a real shock in regard to UK politics and Northern Ireland politics itself. He is someone who is has been seen as having a lot of integrity previously, but of course his reputation, even though he is charged and is innocent until proven guilty, if indeed he is, his reputation is certainly uh, uh, is certainly gone. It'll be interesting as well in terms of when a uh, uh, by-election could happen. His party, the DUP, are under a lot of pressure in his constituency of Lagan Valley in Northern Ireland, which is just outside Belfast, the main city is Lisburn within that uh, constituency, and certainly when a by-election would be held if he has to stand down as, an, down as an MP, which I presume he will, but that is that's not assured. What we know is that he's suspended as a member of the DUP and that he stood down as leader. So we will see what happens in the next uh, part of in the next part of this because it's not going to go away. Huge speculation in terms of what will happen now. Uh, Peter, uh, obviously Sir Geoffrey is uh, innocent until proved guilty. He's been charged. Uh, we don't even actually know if he denies the charges because we haven't got enough information yet, but I think we can probably assume that he does. What will the DUP, how will the DUP navigate this very, very difficult situation? How will they deal well, with it? How will they portray it to the people? They're a very split party uh, by themselves. They're very split. And uh, this was very much in evidence over the decision to go back into government with Sinn Féin. Previously, there was a man called Edwin Poots, who's now actually the Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly, who was very briefly, uh, for I think 21 or 22 days, the leader of the DUP. That fell apart. But there's a hardline element, and then there's a more liberal element within the DUP. And Geoffrey Donaldson was the leader of that. He's tried to unite his party. Well, we've seen other figures like Sammy Wilson, no uh, stranger to this station, to talk TV. He is the was the DUP's chief whip and a long-serving MP for East Antwerp. He stood down as chief whip. So there is real consternation within the DUP and their eight MPs, but also their members of the Assembly in Belfast. So this is very, very difficult for them. And they're very split as a party. Gavin Robinson, who is the deputy leader, who's now the acting leader, I'd be very surprised if he ends up as the leader of the DUP. But certainly, Rishi Sunak spent a lot of time trying to get the devolved government back in Northern Ireland, sorting out the uh, tail end of Brexit, what he would he would see the Windsor framework as uh, as a mechanism to certainly solve the problems of Brexit in the in the UK and all specifically in Northern Ireland. Lots of people will disagree with that and will say that that's not the case. But there was basically parliamentary consensus when the Windsor framework went through, only 29 MPs voting against it, including the DUP, although many more abstained. So the DUP is split. It is in real difficulty anyway. And uh, Geoffrey Donaldson, largely from London as its leader there, rather uh, rather than in, in Northern Ireland, although he was leader there, of course, as well of the whole party, nonetheless was in a situation where he was holding together a very, very fragile coalition within the largest unionist party in Northern Ireland, which had seen its position fall away to being the second largest party. So previously, uh, DUP leaders like Ian Paisley, like Peter Robinson and Arlene Foster had been the first minister of Northern Ireland, but because the DUP in that kind of mandatory coalition was the uh, second largest party, ended up as uh, the de with the deputy first minister post. And Geoffrey Donaldson didn't take that. He's given it to a woman called Emma Little Pengelly, who uh, continues in that role. But it's a very, very difficult time for the DUP. They are in crisis. We also know this morning that Geoffrey Donaldson's social media accounts have been deleted. Uh, so there will be lots of speculation about this charge. We need to be careful about it. He is innocent uh, until proven guilty. But the fact that he has been arrested and someone so high profile has been arrested and indeed charged with something so controversial uh, will have been, uh, you know, the, the police service in Northern Ireland will have taken their time, will have made sure that they are absolutely sure that there are grounds at least for him to be arrested and the fact that it has happened now after devolution has been restored is probably interesting too. Yeah, Peter, thank you ever so much. We're still, of course, joined by former Labour advisor Matthew Laza. I mean, Matthew, it's a, when you put this in context with everything that Northern Ireland's been through over the past few years, so putting aside party politics and the difficulties the DUP mm. faces, it's a very fragile agreement there. Absolutely. We've only just been able to get Hollywood back up and running. Yes, uh, Jeffrey Donaldson Stormont. didn't... Uh, Stormont, sorry. Too much, it, yeah. too much Hollywood normally in the Absolutely. news. Absolutely. Uh, we only just managed to get Stormont back up and running. Um, uh, 
we know that Jeffrey Donaldson isn't uh, the deputy first world, uh, yeah, first minister yeah. there. But uh, this this is going to have a big impact, isn't it, on Northern Irish politics? I mean, and Absolutely. rather cynically, I suppose Sinn Féin might be thinking, well, this is great. Yeah, I think what it will do is, Peter, excellent analysis there, it, it said, is it's very, very destabilising for the DUP. Under this system um, uh, where uh, the two, if, if Stormont's going to sit and the Assembly's going to sit and the executive's going to function, you have to have uh, the largest unionist party and the largest nationalist party which was for you know until this time was uh unionist largest and then the nationalists and now it's the other way around so um the dup got the deputy's uh, first minister's job um uh, they have to remain in now uh, jeffrey donaldson was the uh, leader as it were of the more moderate faction uh, in the du in the dup who wanted to uh, go back into the assembly and the executive and get it restarted and now that he is out of the picture if we put it like that then that i think will shift the balance of power within that and make the, uh, the i don't think we're going to see the dup leave uh, the executive immediately but i think I think if any, you know, there are always shocks in Northern Ireland politics. Something comes along uh, which shakes things up. I think it will make it much more fragile for the DUP to stay in that. So what I think do we it, know the, about the Jeffrey Donaldson Chris. as a guy? You know, what kind of a guy is he? He's married, is he? He's got kids. Yeah. What do we know about this? So guy? he's married with two kids, as, as, as I understand it. I mean, he's, um, you know, he's a very, if I can put it, a, a, a very sort of typical uh, Northern Ireland unionist politician. You know, terrifying. Uh, 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 <laughs> yeah, vaguely sort of terrifying. Didn't he serve in the military at one point? I think so he might think well have done, but he, a but he, in the DUP, I mean, as Peter was saying. He came from the Ulster Unionists, which were the dominant force under the late David Trimble, who um, uh, got, got the peace process going. So he was he was in the, um, the DUP, where he pays these party to remind people who might not have Northern Ireland policy there front of their mind. And then what they've moved is that they've expanded as the as the uh, Ulster Unionists have shrunk and shrunk. He jumped ship very early, uh, uh, just after the um, the Good Friday Agreement. But he was very much seen as on the moderate wing of that party, on the more establishment wing of that party. He came from the Ulster Unionists rather than from the Pays like church. Lifelong politician, do. or does he have a career? Uh, I, I, think he, I think he was in the military. He's certainly been around politics okay. for a yeah, very so, long time. Um, Amiable. He a... uh, does he get on with people? I think that he. I think. I mean, I think that he is not seen as the most relaxed figure uh, in Northern <laughs> Ireland politics, <laughs> nice if I can put it like that. Um, uh, but he's seen as a serious figure uh, who doesn't. Who, I mean, sometimes there's a bit of bombast in Northern Ireland politics. Mm. You know, people we forget here in the rest of the UK um, with our kind of two, three, two and a bit party system. You've got a system in, in, in Northern Ireland with five or six yeah, parties. Yeah. Every show like this in Northern Ireland has to have, has to have a much long, yeah, wider, nice. longer desk, um, uh, etc. Yeah. And so some of those people grandstand. And I think Jeffrey Donaldson was seen as a serious figure who um, was prepared to work. So I think this will be a big, big blow to the moderates within the DUP. I was, going, I was, I was going to ask you, uh, does he have any enemies? But he's in Northern Ireland. So Absolutely. of course he, he has, Well, he has a lot of enemies within his own party yeah, because yeah. the hardcore, there's a small party called the traditional unionist voice who are chipping in from that side into the DUP's vote. And then on the other side, the Alliance Party, which is the cross-community party, um, which takes votes from both Protestants and Catholics, has been on the rise, particularly amongst the middle classes uh, in, in Northern Ireland, who basically want to an end to sort of sectarianism um, uh, in their political choices. So the DUP is under a, a lot of pressure. And obviously, we have a general election in Northern Ireland, just as we will in the rest yeah. of the UK, at some time in the next nine months. OK, mean? well, we'll be coming back to this story throughout the show. It is developing literally as we speak, so uh, stay tuned. Now, coming up after the break, the Prime Minister is being urged to call a summer general election, but can it save the Tories from crushing defeat? I'm Alex oh. Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart screen. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
they might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, Tory MPs are urging the Prime Minister to call a summer election amid fears further delay could end in massive defeats for the party. Don't see how that's going to be any different if they have the election now, but there you go. Those close to Sunak are reportedly warning him against waiting until autumn with the risk of more MPs resigning and growing panic that the Prime Minister could be ousted by Conservative rebels. The Tory unrest has been mounting as polls show Labour is on track for a landslide victory when Britain goes to the ballot boxes. Uh, let's bring in former Labour advisor Matthew Larser, who's still with us, of course. Uh, well, you're probably feeling quite chipper, aren't you, right <laughs> yeah, now? Yeah, I mean, yes, uh, I mean... <laughs> I mean, the, po the point is, I mean, Richard Littlejohn, of all people in the mail today, said, come on, Rishi. So yesterday, there he is, this heartbreak podcast with William Hague, former leader of the yeah. party, of course, say, oh, you know, I miss my kids, this job, you know how demanding it is and all that. And so Richard Littlejohn said, well, you don't have to miss your kids. Just throw in the towel. Absolutely. Why delay the inevitable? You have a lot more... I mean, I tell you what, but, uh, people moaning about... Uh, um, about being prime minister does is not a good look for the electorate, especially mm. one who it's not like you know he sort of it, it's not like it's he had greatness. Upon him. Yes, greatness was not thrust <laughs> upon him. He rather thrust himself upon greatness, as it were, because he clearly manoeuvred for it. And if you're a Boris Johnson fan, you think he, you won't use the word manoeuvre, yeah. uh, would you? You use rather stronger terms for what he yeah. uh, uh, for what he did when Boris went, mm. even if he didn't initially get the prize. And we always we mustn't forget about the Liz mm. Trust premiership. Um, easy, easy though it is. So I mean, you know, don't say that. I think this is just this is one of the problems of not having fixed term parliaments. It's just the public just think it looks absolutely ridiculous. Will he, won't he, will he, won't he? Mm. Um, what he needs to do is set a date for the election now. We've just had in Ireland this week um, a, a new Taoiseach, um, well, he hasn't been elected as Taoiseach, he was elected as party leader when the door reconvened. So he's, they've made clear, because they're in a, a free party coalition, they're going to go the full term. So they, it's just like here, it's actually mm. a, it's a very, very similar, actually, to with the timings are almost... Mm. Um, uh, 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 their election was in January, ours was in December. Mm. Uh, and they've said they're going to go the full term. So fine, that's, that's now sorted. Now, that, whether that's right or wrong, he needs to tell us. Because it, otherwise, he's actually a lame duck. Put puts himself out of his own misery. Exactly. Put the Tories out of their misery is, and put the country out of is, this misery. This I mean, obviously, the sooner the better as far as I'm ridiculous. concerned. But even if you're going to do it in this December, getting ridiculous. tell us. Yeah. But I think the problem is here, you know, yet again, the problem with the Conservatives is they all know best and yet they can't agree on anything. Well, it's the seven families, isn't yeah. it? Which we might they come on to in one of the families. They cannot agree on anything. Minute. And there's a load of them going, well, you know, we've got to wait. Look, if we go now, I've lost my seat, he's lost his seat, she's lost her seat, maybe uh, there'll be a sort of black swan moment which will hurt Labour, maybe there'll be good news when it comes to the economy, if we go now we're definitely done for. Then there are others going, well, if we wait, then we'll be 
even more done for because there'll be more boats uh, across the channel. Literally... Farage is going to yeah, come back. Absolutely. And they're, but they're also looking at it on a personal basis because, of course, the longer that Parliament sits, the longer they're MPs and the longer they get paid as MPs. And a lot of them will be worrying mm. about what they're going to uh, do uh, for jobs uh, after, is... they, uh, uh, after they're elected. Remember after yeah. 97 when there was a exactly. Tory landslide? A lot of them, these poor old Tory MPs, they were kind of features a year on, you know, and people were, were literally claiming the doll. So yeah. um, um, they'll be thinking, do I want a few more months of this? Rishi will be thinking, will a few more months as Prime Minister help me get an even bigger tech job right. uh, uh, so I can go to his Malibu house? Um, and all the time, the public are just wringing their hands and, and they obviously desperately want change. Well, even those who aren't Labour supporters want to express their dissatisfaction uh, yeah. with other parties. And let me tell you, tell, look, the, the, he thinks that things might get better economically over the summer, so if he goes to the polls in October, the Tories might do better. Uh, but what is also going to happen over the summer is going to be an ongoing invasion of migrants' boats. Uh, and uh, that will, won't be a good look. We're already... And seeing, nobody going to Rwanda. Yeah, nobody going to the, Rwanda. The migrant crisis not solved. The general atmosphere of disintegration. Yeah. I mean, actually, I think if he hangs on till October, his results will be worse than he called the election I think, in June. Me, I think it's the law of diminishing returns. Yeah, the longer yeah, you go on, yeah. uh, uh, the, the worse the result is going to be. So actually, you can see why some people are saying go, get, go in the autumn. And, you know, they're getting to the stage where it's like, oh, if we have it in this month, will the students who they perceive... Well, actually, all polls show favour Labour and parties to the left of Labour. Oh, if the students aren't around, then maybe, you know, the students at university and, and not in their marginal seats in their home counties, maybe that'll save a few in the blue wall. It's pretty desperate stuff. Mm. And the public can see right through it. We need an election date fix, and then we can... Um, uh, then at least, even if he's going to go later, at least we know, we, we know when it is. I think something that has triggered a lot of this gossip today has been this really funny uh, honours list, uh, Good Friday honours list that's out been at, rushed at, out. at five o'clock on, right. a, on a, this... the day before a bank holiday. I mean, talk about the old, uh, rather right. awful phrase and the notorious phrase in politics, burying bad news. So this guy has given £5 million to the Tories, which this is, is the last... Mohammed Mansour. Mohammed Mansour. But why did he get a knighthood? Because he's he's he gave £5 million pounds oh, to the Tories. Right. <laughs> is that how oh, it yeah. works? What, what now first you attract, tell... as Mrs Mercer said, what first attract is just a millionaire pulled down? Yeah, if he gave £10 million, he'd be a lord. Well, I was going to say, I think he's got rather bad value for his... Yes. For, his, for, his, for, his, for his money. Five million is well, well worth uh, a period. I, I, I mean, I actually think that, you know, this is so blatant. I know. Um, I mean, I can never remember whether the... I mean, Labour was investigated for, for selling the peerages. And, of course, Lloyd George, after the Lloyd George, uh, you know, back after the uh, First World War was famously... Uh, there was actually a tariff uh, for various levels of honours, you know, depending on the <laughs> check he wrote to the Lloyd George Fund, yeah. um, uh, which supported his own favoured candidates. There was a a shopping list. And, uh, you know, th so this guy's given £5 million. He is a controversial figure. He was... He, I mean, mm -hmm. he's... He, he is obviously it's a legal donation to the Tory party, but between 2006 and 2009, so pretty much in uh, recent memory, he was actually the transport minister of Egypt, Egypt I know. under Hosni Mubarak, who yeah. was then removed in what the Arab Spring, which yeah, we've, all, yeah. we've all forgotten about. So he is, you know, and Hosni Mubarak wasn't the nicest person, if I can put it like that, yeah. in the world. So, I mean, there are lots of questions will be asked. And, of course, giving him a night who just reminds people uh, uh, of this donation. I, I bet you haven't opened my email still. Here's one from the Labour Party saying, you know, look at this, give us a fiver. It, this, this is simple. This is simple. This is just take honest. away... The power of patronage from yep. politicians, Absolutely. from prime ministers, party leaders, they can no longer make people knights or peers of the realm ends. Then so, we yeah, wouldn't I mean, have look, a problem. We, clearly, this brings the whole honour system absolutely into disrepute. This is disgusting. And it makes the, ca and it makes the case... I know this is about uh, knighthoods rather than peerages, but, but it makes the case disgusting. the lords even stronger. This cannot go on. This is of course disgusting all parties to have behold, done it, isn't But it? this is not... I mean, sometimes yeah. at least they can find another reason. There's normally a sort of, you know... Uh, uh, well, they've normally. done a lot of charity work or, you know... Um, this isn't somebody yeah. who's invented the right. vaccine or, you know, yeah. so it's but helping to, to, to defeat cancer. This is why normally you wait until sort of New Year's honours yes. list or the King's yes. birthday or whatever, because then you've got a whole swathe of them. You've got about 100 for us to pour through going, oh, yeah, give them that to your yeah. mate, have you? And then all these other lovely people... The excuse people. here was that Vaughan Gethin, the new First this Minister of Wales, just... had to go on the Privy Council. Why couldn't you just put Vaughan Gethin in the Privy Council, which is, you know, yeah. is this rather archaic thing, but it means people can talk on terms yeah. uh, 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 and they do make certain decisions, uh, as we saw during mm. the uh, King's accession. Uh, why couldn't you just do that? I suspect if you're a cynic, you, when the date of the election, maybe maybe they want to encourage Mr Mansour to get the chequebook back out again. Well, no, exactly. Well, it, that, it looks that way, doesn't it? it? But, I mean, Rishi Sunak's very politically naive, isn't he? I mean, it's very I thought it was bad enough when he brought back Lord Spadeface this of is, a this shipping is, Norton, this is but apparently not. This is, this is sordid. It's so it's sordid. Is, it it's really a sordid, sordid spectacle that years. they impose on yeah. us time yeah. and time again yeah. and we're just supposed to lap it up. I've had enough of it. Yeah, when volunteering with the Monday, the message the Monday service yesterday, Monday money service yesterday from the King about public service. Giving money to the poor and the Conservatives are dishing out honours.
Morris. Um, um, yeah, because, of course, the man who originally, here's a little piece of political trivia, was called Maundy Gregory, the guy who sold the peers, uh, peerages for Lloyd George. Oh, that's, dear, a, that's a smooth, that's a smooth link. <laughs> right, let's uh, talk oh, about Angela Rayner. Uh, the, pressure is about Angela. Uh, the pressure like, is mounting. The pressure is mounting. Like that on this show, we do. Well, Absolutely. yesterday we were discussing oh, yeah. it because Manchester Police had uh, reopened the case, as it were. They initially decided no cause to investigate because she said she was living at this house uh, when others say she wasn't. Therefore, she avoided capital gains tax. It was her right to buy a house, council house. She Which made, is perfectly legal. She made right nothing wrong with that. Made about 45 grand out of it. Uh, the question is, was she living there or not? She said she was. Others say she wasn't. If so, she uh, evaded... Uh, avoided uh, capital gains cap tax and there's also a question of uh, electoral uh, dubiousness because uh, she may be guilty of electoral fraud as well that's what she she denies all of this yes of she course. denies everything but the police have reopened their investigation say so we are now in well they're reviewing the they're reviewing, well, they're their quite decision. Reopening they're reviewing their decision not to investigate but the pressure was mounted uh, last night as Stockport Council yeah. uh, the local council concerned uh, said that they were reopening Reopening yeah. their uh, sort of their, their sort of search. Stockport Council's uh, into the situation. Like well, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, it ain't uh, looking good for it, uh, Yeah, yeah it, look, I, th I think what both the council and the police have now done is the right thing, which is questions have been raised, uh, both in this book by um, Tory Peer, Lord Ashcott, a biography of Angela Rayner, yeah. but also, um, uh, and then they've been sort of yeah. uh, Tory MPs run with it. And so I think we need to leave both. Well, no, whoa, 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 whoa. One yeah. thing, one thing. Look, she says uh, all she did was uh, uh, follow official advice from her tax advisors and lawyers. Uh, well, and I think what you said. So, no, wait a second, yeah, Matthew. Sorry, sorry, wait, wait a second. Yeah, uh, and uh, what people have said is, well, why don't you show us that piece of paper? Yeah. Nobody is asking. She said, oh, that's my personal tax affairs. Nobody is asking for her personal tax details. They are asking for that document, the document that said, you're fine, no capital gains tax, and don't worry about electoral fraud. Uh, they're asking for that. Uh, why won't she publish it? Well, I think she won't publish it because Why? she feels very. She feels that she's personally under attack uh, about this, and I think. Hang I, on, Matt. Hang, that, no, no, I'm not saying I reason. think this. I'm saying what but Angela that's thinks. That's ridiculous. Yeah, I'm saying what I think. I my, you're asking my take on what Angela thinks, and I think Angela is. No, she thinks she's, your take. she's treated. Uh, she's treated for. She thinks she's treated differently as a working class woman um, uh, compared to that. So why she said any media interview? That's garbage. Will you publish that's my? That's garbage. You, yeah, you, you know that's, that's what she garbage. said. Well, I think show she, us the show us the piece of paper. So what's confusing is she says she didn't have a tax lawyer at the time. What she's done is she's taken. Because most people yeah. who are selling a you know forty thousand you know uh, it, you wouldn't, have, wouldn't a tax have a tax lawyer, lawyer. Yeah. That, yeah. which I think we'd all agree. But she says she's taken subsequent advice um, and, and that she and she's told that she doesn't she doesn't owe uh, anything. This the controversy on this is it seems that the Labour hierarchy Sue Gray the uh, Le Labour leader's office the former head yeah. of ethics at the Cabinet Office and uh, formerly of course of um, uh, of Partygate uh, 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 fame um, uh, has, has has I understand ha has looked at it. I think what we want is uh, I think the police and Stockport Council are right to look at this as a Stockport Council taxpayer, um, as I'm selling my mum's house there. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Be careful um, about capital gains. Absolutely. You know. No, no, no. I very much am. <laughs> I should be paying every penny. Um, uh, I think that they both need to look at it and then let's see. And obviously, if she, if they de if they declare that there is nothing uh, 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 amiss, if, then that is an end of if it. If both the council and the police say, right, we've yeah. re-examined... And the council's not a Labour council, by the way. It's run by the Liberals. Yeah, well, that, that, but, but uh, I'm sure it's not political. No, no, right? absolutely. But it's just, just, just to add, you know... I uh, mean... It's not her mates on the council. It seems to me that, at the very least, you know, she had a, she owned a house, she bought a house, she married a guy who bought a house. Her brother then, after she got married, moved into her house with her, and she didn't move in with her husband. That's well, there are complicated. I mean, modern families are complicated, and one of the complicated factors here is that her son was in intensive care for, for a long time. So she obviously spent a lot of time at the hospital. I believe she did spend, you know, lots of nights with her her husband in a different house. She didn't get around to merging the two, uh, you know, the the, the 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 two households together. And the electoral fraud allegation is that she was on the electoral register in two different places. Not that she voted twice or anything like that, yeah. but she should have just put the line through yeah. one of them. But the, on the, the issue is where she was living. Thing. Where she was living. Yeah, but I think the more serious thing I think is the is the issues around uh, the capital gains tax um, uh, that um, uh, that, are, that are being, and it's right. I think I think Greater Manchester Police rather rushed their, to their to the conclusion, and I think it's right that they uh, apparently they didn't speak okay. to two or three of the key people and let them speak to the okay. key people to okay. find out what the truth is. Okay, just to speculate now, she denies all wrongdoing, yeah. and I'm sure she'll be fine when it all comes out in the wash. But uh, suppose she does get nicked. in the unlikely event. No, well, hang on a second. No, it's not, it's either it's neither likely nor no, unlikely. Absolutely. 
really. It's very possible. Uh, in the event she gets... I was trying to make you smile there. Okay. <laughs> if she gets nicked, uh, here's the thing, uh, it'll be a bad day for Labour, they'll still win the election. Yeah, I would have thought. I mean, clearly, if 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 if, if she if she, if she is found um, uh, guilty, you know, to, 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 guilty as it were, yeah, guilty as uh, uh, no, if she is found guilty, yeah, uh, then, not as it were, uh, th then there would be. <laughs> then I think if she's, I think it's on the electoral thing. If she should have crossed it off at one of the things, I think that's not a major offence. Um, that can be regarded not as massive. Oversight. No, I agree with that. Yeah, I think it's on the the money issue capital is clearly gains, more important. Yeah. The capital yeah. gains tax issue but, is more important. If for any reason she wasn't the deputy leader of the Labour Party anymore, um, I suspect what there would be. The Labour Party has this very long procedure yeah. where our 400,000 members trade union fleets have to vote I think what would happen is only one candidate would end up being nominated okay. it would be a woman and either can't be from London because okay. we, we've got Keir so it won't be West Streeting okay. uh, even though a lot of people would, would do that maybe you could get Rebecca wrong daily I, 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 as her staff you could call it it certainly won't be it, 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 it certainly won't be her I think <laughs> the, the most likely person I think would be Liz Kendall uh, or Bridget Phillipson uh, okay good discussion uh, good luck Angela uh, and imagine the scramble at Westminster City Hall on Thursday morning as officials hunted for Easter eggs big enough to fill one of the building's ground floor windows. The Labour-run body rushed to put up decorations after Tory councillor Paul Swaddle pointed out that the Islamic holy month of Ramadan was celebrated with its own display with nothing to be seen for the Christian holiday. Uh, the Easter adornments were hastily sourced and put in place by 5pm in the window next to Ramadan decorations uh, that had already been in place. Uh, I mean, there are so many other examples of why, weirdly, Easter, Christian Easter, seems to be uh, taking second place to Ramadan these days. Don't forget you had Iceland with the tick buns, no longer hot cross yeah. buns. Also, can I just say, looking at this display, looking at our big screen over here, it seems the Ramadan display has got all the lovely things like mosques and the symbols of Islam. The Easter display has got some chocolate eggs. Well, I, I do, don't I see think, any so, sniffer genes. So, so I know the City Hall very well because the, the, when I was working for the Labour Party headquarters was once it was just the other side of it and right next to it is a mini Waitrose. It rather looks to me like they've gone and begged Waitrose. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> literally what they did. That's literally what they did. So, literally what they did. Someone was dispatched out into why, the streets to find but eggs. This is the next thing. Why is it in this day and age we're so scared of talking about what Easter is and we keep portraying it as an opportunity to just scoff loads of chocolate? I'm sorry, it's the most important day in the Christian And why calendar. you shouldn't say Happy Easter today because today why is Good Friday. Happy Easter should be saved for for Sunday, uh, 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 obviously, when uh, uh, when Christ rose rather than was... Uh, so he is risen, he yeah. is risen indeed. Yeah. But, um, but, but no, but why is it, you know, looking at this display that Westminster Council have cobbled together in Westminster <sighs> They have window, not covered themselves in glory. Uh, it's still, what, just some chickens and some eggs? I'm quite tempted to go it's to Poundland and take some stuff. It's got nothing to do with the Bible and Christianity. Why is it that actually, oh. even if we do get to talk about Easter, we're not allowed to label it as a Christian festival, but just some Cadbury's invented commercial exercise? Well, Cadbury's, of course, themselves have got into trouble because one of their stores, uh, uh, one of their outlet stores has branded it. I'm sure this was done by uh, some well-meaning person on site rather than headquarters has described eggs as gesture eggs, not Easter eggs. Uh, gesture. You know, the thing, the thing is, the Christian side of it, for most people, Easter is eating chocolate eggs. Uh, yeah. You know, don't forget, no, don't forget, not. you keep going about the Church of England, about half a million people go to Church of England churches on a Sunday. Uh, there's 70 million people in this country. Yeah. Right. Not exactly I, going I, great I know, guns, this, is it? No, but this this is a festival. I'm sorry, but this is a it's Christian festival. It's a festival of eating Easter eggs. So show some blooming Christian things in it. Why are we so scared of Christian things? It's not. Oh, you mean a cross or something? Yeah, yes. good idea. Yeah, I sure. don't know. I... Perhaps suggest that it's more than just chocolate because it is. Not I mean, from, there is no irony, me, of course, not. that Westminster City Hall literally faces the Catholic Cathedral, Westminster Catholic Cathedral, and about 100 metres down the road is Westminster Abbey, the seat of, uh, uh, as it were, our national yeah. seat of, 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 uh, of faith. Um, I mean, what I would say about that is I think Easter's an interesting one because even people who don't go actually go to church think about um, Easter because of the time, about the sense of renewal and the sense of hope. So yeah. I think actually people reflect more at Easter than they do at Christmas. It even is, if you don't go to it is just right, really, yeah. really bizarre the way Ramadan seems to be taking over oh. from Easter but we, and everybody's we've going We've never had Holy Ver I mean, even in the 1950s, you wouldn't have had train stations with, with, with Bible verses put up and yet suddenly we got a religious verse put up. That was, the, I think that's the biggest of the mistakes of the, is all was the, was the network rail one, which, which I think was, there was such a, a, a kickback on, right? Well, just, just the other Including day, from some on the left, thank Just goodness. the other day, it was holy, the Hindu festival of spring and renewal. Yeah. Didn't even peep about that one. Got a Hindu uh, Prime Minister. So, songs of Praise on the Beeb had a Ramadan special the other day. They did They did. I used to work in BBC Religion they with Songs of Praise. I was, I was actually told, that because it was the, the office was a very long, sort of corridor-esque, I was told I walked down the corridor too fast, it was upsetting Songs of Praise.
<laughs> Don't upset yes. Songs of Praise. I've been my Westminster way. Who actually watches Songs of Praise? It means a lot to, uh, to it means a lot to uh, about an audience of about a million people, people who can't get out, and um, yeah. and people a lot of people just like if they like to see the kind of visits to places and hear about people doing things in their towns. I, I like I like songs of praise. I just find it unwatchable. I love the idea of it, but. Uh... It's it was a bore. shock. It's a bit I, went from, I went from working in Westminster to, to BBC Religion, which is then in Manchester, and they, you know, kind of had hymn books on their desk and everything. It was a culture shock. See, I know that Radio Four have just got rid of Tweet of the Day, which I'm like, don't do that. I love Tweet of the Day, but at least we still have Prayer for the Day. Absolutely, I oh, do like that. <laughs> no, I do like it. Prayer for the Day, nice. Look, you the don't day. have to. I like Thought, I like for, the thought for the Day as well. Asinine Thought for the Day. I like with Thought Radio for the Day. Four. No, I like it. I thought today's was especially good. In oh, fact. really? What was it? Yeah, well, it's all about Easter, and it was. Um, okay, not Ramadan. Uh, apparently BBC. no, oh, it was actually, actually was They've about changed. Easter, <laughs> thankfully. I have got no problem defending this country's culture. Now, your texts and tweets have been coming in thick and fast this lunchtime as one London council scrambles to celebrate Easter after only putting up a Ramadan display. We've been asking whatever happened to traditional British Easter. Ian writes, woke Labour and the now Tories have watered down Easter and Christianity. Look at the London Ramadan lights everywhere when there's nothing for Easter. Susan says, I've asked that to myself many times today. I'm trying to get a dear friend to try to find our dear Lord and Saviour. And when I asked about the day, it made them realise how far removed from the truth many people are. I like this theme. Uh, we've, we've struck a chord, you know. Uh, Tim says, uh, blame the people in charge of the country, no one else. And Greg writes, take a look at the lights around uh, for other religious festivals, then ask the same question. It's slowly being replaced. It certainly is. It is. Well, not so slowly anymore. Yes, friend. speedily being yeah, replaced. Gone, gone by 2030. <laughs> yeah, next year, there won't be any Easter. All right, we've still got the second coming to look forward to, so don't worry. Uh, now, coming up after the break, Thames Water is in trouble as its shareholders call for customer bills to increase by 40% to prop up its finances. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, 
had lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're that supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips, and this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, Britain's largest water company is in serious trouble after they were told by the government that they can't hit consumers with increased prices to prop up their finances. The shareholders of Thames Water renewed their demands to increase customer bills by 40% in order to save the company from nationalisation. We're still joined, of course, by the wonderful former Labour oh. advisor, Matthew Lowther. I only come for the compliments. Uh, <laughs> we loved you. Oh. Uh, you know, this... I love you both, too. We're probably all... <laughs> Even when we disagree. Oh. All right, enough of this. Let's get, let's get back into the game. I'm not having that. I'm not having that. It's a spirit of Easter. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. No, but uh, we're probably all, I'm guessing, customers in some way of Thames Water. Yeah, yeah I am. Um, yeah. Yeah. You pay a, an arm and a leg anyway for I'm the lucky water it's disguised these days. in my service charge. I live in a flat, but um, yeah, it's yeah, in you there. Are, we are all but, in yeah, there. Absolutely, these, yeah. You know, we drink out, it. They've just been filling the Thames with effluent, yep. leaks popping up all over the place. That is, you know, basically their it's job. It's one in four British households, basically, that they serve. They're by far the largest water company. Yeah. And this is a massive political headache now for both parties. Mm -mm. It's a massive political headache for the government because the government's going to have uh, to handle the immediate crisis. And there's a dispute with Jacob Rees-Mogg, former cabinet minister on the Tory right, saying just let the company go bankrupt. Well, um, loads of pension funds are tied but up in it. Exactly, including the um, it's it's one of the big Canadian public sector pension funds, but it's also the universities, which is the largest uh, uh, individual pension fund in the country. It's the university superannuation scheme um, uh, is in it. So therefore, you'd basically be damaging people's pensions. So will they be prepared to do that? And also, of course, the government wants to get foreign pension funds to spend billions on new nuclear power stations. I mean, the so there's a big thing. And Labour has just gone back on its nationalisation pledge. Difficulty though is I think nationalising a lot of these sort of key infrastructure companies costs a lot of money. If you nationalise them rather so than pick simple. up the pieces, yeah. Right. It's not so simple, just click your fingers and go, right, that's nationalised, job done. It costs a ludicrous amount yeah. of money, taxpayers' or... money, when there's not much of that knocking about. Yeah. But what I want to know is what's gone wrong here? Because it seems to me, whether you look at energy companies, whether you look at water companies, whether you look at train companies, what you have are executives taking home massive pay yeah. packets for badly managing Absolutely. their private sector companies. It seems to me these private sex companies have far too big monopolies as well that they become impossible to, to manage because they are megalithic yeah. in size and structure that you've got issues popping up all over the place um, but it's all contributing to this general sense that people get is I'm paying more money for something that is less well run and then I'm asked to pay even more money well, I mean, uh, to mop up the errors. Absolutely. We didn't get onto it but there's actually an Easter egg you're paying more money for less at the moment because um, shrinkflation which I know is a silly little thing but it just adds to that sense which the water companies exemplify that are uh, that really that we've been taken for a ride, basically. Uh, and so if, you, if you're on the Tories, this puts capitalism, gives capitalism a bad name. If yeah. you're Labour, it puts pressure on you yeah. to renationalise. The one thing that people might do is, net, remember Network Rail when Labour nationalised it? It basically picked up the pieces and eventually gave 500 million. Yeah, there was about yeah, 10 years of court the, cases. The trouble with nationalisation, something's gone wrong uh, with the privatisation of our water system. Something badly wrong. Basically, I would say the culprit is sheer naked greed on the part of the people who run these awful mm. companies. Uh, but I, I uh, recoil at the thought of nationalisation of anything because I was around in the in the 60s and the 70s uh, when everything was nationalised. I remember my mum used to have to go to a government shop in order to buy uh, washing machines or fridges from the government for, through British Gas yeah. and all that. Uh, nationalisation does not work. Well, on water, of course, what What's interesting is that Scotland and uh, Northern Ireland, the water is still uh, is still state owned, uh, and in Wales, um, uh, uh, the company is a different, it's a mutual model. Um, Old uh, Welsh uh, water. Uh, Welsh water, Dwar Cymru, um, and um, uh, so therefore neither of them. I, I, I think if you actually look at the leaks this week, so take mm. aside Thames, when they were looking at there, they actually said people asked, oh, what's the situation in Scotland and Northern Ireland? Found it was no better yeah. broadly. Yeah. So it's uh, not, it's, it's certainly not a magic wand, which a lot on the left it's think it is. Certainly not. But mm. the anger. 
anger. 69% of the public want it, want it renationalised because the anger. If you look at, because it's just because it's, it's the, If you've got nothing else to do, exactly. go online and look at this structure of Thames Water, which is hilarious because they've got about all these little companies yeah. that owe money to this bit and that bit uh, and the other bit. And that's what brings yeah. capitalism. Yeah, I also there. remember yeah. British Rail, which was an absolute... You think the privatised rail systems are bad, you should have been on British Rail. Absolute disaster. Now, let's move on. Talking of disasters, uh, what a great link that oh. was. Uh, the England away kit is now out selling the home strip. We're talking about the England football yeah. team. It's not really who, the England home kit, is it? That's wait, the point. Well, well, no, the, the, the home kit has the not the non-cross, yeah. the uh, improved kit. The away kit still has... The traditional what, what country is that cross. then, Kev? What, what is that? Uh, well, that you're looking at? What country a, is that? That's the uh, United Nations of Nike. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Nike the said Nike. that they playfully updated that. So that is the main kit that traditionally massively outsells yeah. the away kit. Guess what? The away kit is now outselling that for the first right. time in England national soccer. Well, I think my leader, Keir Starmer, who uh, started the uh, uh, the charge against this yeah, uh, United no, Nations Labour were good on this. So uh, I, I hope he's got his, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's one of those who's, le who's led the charge uh, to get the away kit so you actually have the flag of St George. It's just totally daft. And look, I'm in favour of things like, you know, the rainbow laces that the players wore on a particular day to make a particular point, etc. But not this, which doesn't keep anybody happy. It's just silly. Uh, and therefore, um, it just brings, like, you know, doing different things into dis disrepute. So, I'd, I'd say good the on the British punters I going to the away kit. I'd say the rainbow laces kit. were a bit silly as well. Oh, oh we can't have rainbow that. laces. Just, you know, I just miss the good old days when a sports team put football. on kit and played a yes. blimmin' game. Can you remember when they had long shorts down below their knees, can't you, Kev? Yeah, when I was a kid, yeah. yeah. Short shorts I would go for. Uh, <laughs> choice. But funny enough, the shorts have got long again now. Yes, yeah, yeah. Not quite as long as footballers in the 70s. They're wearing hot pants. They really are. <laughs> Bring back those right, days. let's talk about the BBC. The BBC oh. always moaning about not having enough money because all it gets is 3.5 billion quid a year from us. They're they're, they're going to cut 100 hours worth of TV, worth yeah. of drama. Uh, they're axing the daytime soap doctors. Uh, there'll be much 10 fewer hours of the CBBC, CBBs, uh, and so on and so forth. So there's going to be much, much less television produced by this company, this uh, state broadcaster that says it hasn't got enough money. It has got more money than Croesus. Uh, you know, the, the commercial broadcasters look at the BBC and say, what do you do with all that money? Money, they waste it, not on making good programs. Well, I, I, I would defend the BBC uh, to a certain extent. I think there are lots of brilliant programs in the BBC, and there are lots of brilliant things the BBC does. But I think there is a crucial lack of leadership in the BBC yes. at the moment. Agree. Yeah, somebody, you my pension's there. Never right. mind Thames Order. My pension's the you BBC. You and I have both right. worked for the we BBC, have. albeit you worked there longer than I did. But I've got one more thing stars. that I did find, because I started off at ITV and went to the BBC. I did too. At ITV, it was me, a cameraman, and that was it. And I used my own editing suite at the BBC. Five thousand. I got a pay rise when I left ITV. Working on BBC. one clip. Yeah. Ridiculous. Look, I, look, there, there are lots of issues. The thing about the BBC is it needs to decide what it wants to do. What so, we've got to do is go to break, though, Matthew. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Thank you very much, Matthew Larza. <laughs> Excellent. Have a good Easter weekend. Thank everybody. you very much. Now, coming up after said break, we'll have more on Sir Jeffrey Donaldson stepping down as the DUP's leader. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho, so anyway. <laughs> just... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon. Welcome back to Crosstalk. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And we are with you live from 1 until 3 p.m. every weekday. Coming up in this hour, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson steps down as the DUP's leader following historical sex offence charges. And Rayner is on the ropes. The Deputy Labour leader is under pressure as police and council officials say they will review again whether she committed tax fraud. And Thames Water is in hot water. The water company serving a quarter of the UK's population, including me and Alex, is fighting against nationalisation as its shareholders demand customer bills are hiked by 40%. All that coming up, but first let's get the news headlines with Nadira Tudor. Good afternoon. The leader of the DUP has quit over historic sexual offence allegations. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson wrote to the party chairman stepping down with immediate effect. All his social media accounts have been deleted. He'll appear in court next month alongside a woman who's also been charged with aiding and abetting with connection with the alleged offences. Pending the outcome of the judicial process, Donaldson has also been suspended from the party in accordance with party rules. Gavin Robinson has been appointed as the interim party leader. The Prime Minister has come under fire for giving a major Tory donor a knighthood. Mohammed Mansour, a businessman and a senior treasurer for the party, was honoured for his business, charity and political service. Last year, he gave £5 million, which is one of the biggest donations to the Conservatives in decades. Meanwhile, pressure is mounting on Labour's Angela Rayner in the ongoing tax row over the sale of her council house. The deputy Labour leader says she's confident she hasn't broken any rules. Party chair Annalise Dodds agrees. I've got complete confidence in her. And, you know, really, I think we need to ask the question, why are we seeing this petty politicking coming from the Conservatives? You know, I know that rather than talking about the finances of one individual, many people watching this will be saying, well, hang on, why aren't politicians talking about family finances? Journalists here at News UK are showing support for their colleague journalist, Evan Gershkovich. The 32-year-old has now been detained illegally by Russia for one year. He's being held on spying charges, despite there being no evidence provided to date. The US describes him as wrongfully jailed. We're not expecting to see Kate Middleton this Easter while she's being treated for cancer. But King Charles is expected to make an appearance at Windsor Castle's Easter Sunday service. Royal commentator Michael Cole told Talk Today it's hugely important to him. It means a lot to him. He is a man of faith. Um, and Easter is arguably 
a more significant and more important date in the Christian calendar, even than Christmas. Uh, and he's determined to be there and the Queen will be there with him. And finally, British soldiers might soon be seen with full facial hair. The army has lifted a ban on serving soldiers having beards after years of discussion around its facial hair policy. However, the beards and moustaches must be well groomed and neat and they will be routinely checked. That's your news now. Here's your weather with Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello again. There will be some tricky driving conditions today because of the weather. Again, heavy showers and thunderstorms, some hail thrown in as well. You can just see the showery nature of the weather. There will be some gaps in between the showers there with a little bit of sunshine, but I think for many, it's just one of those days, really. Lots of showers, particularly heavy this afternoon through northern parts of England and up into Scotland, Northern Ireland as well. It could well just turn a bit drier across more southern areas to end the day, thankfully, and temperatures will reach around 12 or 13 degrees, a little bit up on yesterday's not as windy either. Now, as we head through this evening and tonight, well, there will be some drier conditions developing across many central and eastern parts of England and Wales. Still for Scotland and Northern Ireland, some showers. But uh, under the clearer skies here, it will turn a little chilly, the odd pocket of frost. And I think we'll see some mist and fog forming later in the night as well. So temperatures in towns and cities holding up near a five or six degrees, but still a bit chilly. Out there first thing in the morning, though, quite optimistic for some sunshine. I think the showers on Saturday are more likely to be across Scotland and Northern Ireland, where it will be quite uh, breezy, but elsewhere, nice in the sunshine, that's for sure. And uh, it could well be that we see temperatures climbing to 12 to maybe even 14 or 15 mid-afternoon. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome back to the show. We have lots coming up over the next hour, including the latest on Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, MP, stepping down as leader of the Democratic Unionist Party after revealing that he has been charged with historical sex offence charges. Uh, but another theme of this show, uh, we came up with it ourselves, didn't we, we this did. morning, uh, Alex? With uh, divine inspiration, we thought, we some thought might we say. <laughs> OK. We, we decided uh, instead uh, of crosstalk, uh, we were going to have... Yeah, that's right. Let's just turn it around. Yeah. So uh, God works in mysterious ways. But, uh, uh, you know, it's Good Friday. Uh, if you go to, into central London, uh, uh, um, Oxford Street and Regent Street, the two main shopping thoroughfares, are bedecked with lights celebrating mm. Ramadan. Uh, I heard an advert this morning uh, on Talk TV, actually, for one of the supermarkets saying, if you're stocking up for Ramadan, why don't you come and shop here? Uh, why don't they say, if you're stocking up for Ramadan and Easter? I mean, uh, what, what, why <laughs> is it? You know, and then you get Iceland taking the crosses off hot cross buns. It's as if we're ashamed of our own religion, we are. isn't it? No, but we are, because Christianity has become the thing that you can kick, basically. And it's all of these sort of woke neo-everythings who want to dismantle religion, they want to dismantle culture. It's basically cultural Marxism, this is what they do. And then refill the void with all their neo-religions, like, I don't know, climate change and trans rights. And, you know, they just want the to NHS. get rid of all the social structures and whatever it is that, you know, has held the country together for 2,000 years and pour in their own poison. And this is a very, very dangerous route to go down. Look, I will keep saying, it doesn't matter whether you believe in God, doesn't matter whether you like Christianity, at least people in this country and people in the West in general need to have at least some iota of understanding of what that religion has meant to us in terms of our progress, in terms of, you know, even simple things like innovation. When it came to developing technologies, uh, the buccaneering age of enterprise and exploring the globe, these were very often backed by Christian countries because it's part of the Christian ethos, whereas there've been in other religions a sort of more, well, don't do that, that's against the book don't do that, that's against our conservative values. When it comes to our rights and freedoms, when it comes to the equality of women and our place in society, whatever it is that you want to talk about, that we uphold as these virtues, as these morals, which now it put into sort of human rights legislation that the woke classes then are using to batter us with, these things came from Judeo-Christian values. And do you know what? You can continue down this path if you like to pretend it never happened, to somehow blame it for this country's ills when it's done nothing wrong apart from actually prop this country up. But 
but what is being ushered in instead, and it is being ushered in us instead, and it is being forced upon us, isn't of our choosing. I don't know anybody in the UK who's democratically asked for this to happen. And what I find even more alarming is these Ramadan lights that are up on Oxford Street, the main thoroughfare, the main shopping street of our capital city, have been privately funded by an individual, right? So how did that pass muster? Yeah, and also, I this mean, private individual owns a load of buildings in central London, one of which, the Trocadero, famous old entertainment venue in Soho, the heart of the LGBT it's probably community. probably going to become a mosque. He <laughs> wants to turn into a mosque. What's uh, going on? Uh, uh, why is, Ka- is Cabri's calling Easter eggs gesture eggs? Uh, why did Network Rail put a sign up saying all the best for Ramadan? Uh, no uh, mention of uh, Easter and so on and so forth. They seem to be eradicating Obsessed. Easter. We don't understand why. Yeah. Over to you. Well, do you? Because we've been asking you whatever happened to the traditional British Easter. You can give us a call, 0344 499 1000. Do it on Good Friday, why don't you? It'd be yeah. nice to have a chin wag about this. Text us 8722, write talk before your text, or you can tweet us on X at Talk TV. And we have had loads of your texts and tweets coming in, so let's read some of them now. Ray has written, from what I have seen, the white people of this country don't practice religion and practically almost all churches are abandoned or empty. People don't pray and most British white people are atheist or don't practice Christianity. So I do see a massive change from the 1980s. You can't blame other cultures apart, only ourselves and our government. Robert says, I miss celebrating our special religious holidays like Christmas and Easter. It's like we we no longer matter anymore. The government, council and Church of England are woeful and weak. And we should celebrate other religions, but not at the expense of our own. Good point that. We seem to eradicate Christmas now as well. Don't forget we're ashamed of not only Easter, but also Christmas. Uh, God knows why. Uh, Andrew writes, uh, we grew up and left religion behind. eh? And Paul says, consumerism and self-indulgent greed. Well, let's uh, go to the breaking political news that's happened in the last hour, and that is that the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, has stepped down from his position with immediate effect. Donaldson has written a letter to the party chairman confirming that he has been charged with historical sex offences. In accordance with the party rules, the party officers have suspended Donaldson from membership pending the outcome of a judicial process. The party officers this morning unanimously appointed Gavin Robinson MP as the interim party leader. Uh, We can speak now again to Talk TV chief political commentator Peter Carbwell. Uh, Peter, I'm assuming the situation is just as it was uh, an hour ago, uh, but this will develop over the weekend. Uh, But let's talk more about Geoffrey Donaldson. Before we get on to the political ramifications of his predicament, uh, uh, let's talk a bit about him as a man. Uh, What what is his history? He's a military man. When did he become an MP? Tell us about his career, as it were. Yeah, he has a fascinating uh, history within unionism and has been a real titan of unionism really for the last um, 40 plus years in Northern Ireland. So this is a massive political shock, certainly, and really nobody saw it coming. The only development really over the last hour or so is that we now have the date for which there will be the hearing in regard to those charges against Mr. Donaldson and a 57 year old woman, which will be on the 24th of April. So there's a few weeks to go before we find out uh, whether he'll, uh, what what happens in regard to those charges. but. In, in regard to his history, a fascinating character. He was in the UDR, the Ulster Defence Regiment um, of the Army, of the UK Army, and uh, was the agent, actually political agent and campaign manager for Enoch Powell. Enoch Powell, you may remember, was at the, towards the end of his career an MP in Northern Ireland, and both in 1983 and 1986, Geoffrey Donaldson managed those campaigns. So he's a sort of fascinating character from that perspective. He became an MP himself in 1997, and in fact, is the longest serving Northern Ireland MP, initially for the Ulster Unionist Party, David Trimble's party. And then uh, actually with with a grim irony, uh, the Good Friday 1998, uh, exactly 26 years ago, was when Geoffrey Donaldson, who had been a negotiator of the Belfast Agreement, uh, walked out of those negotiations on in the early hours of Good Friday, just before the agreement was signed, because he wasn't happy with some of the content of it and became very against that agreement, although it was five years later that he eventually left the Ulster Unionist Party, was independent for a short time, 
and then joined the party of which he would later become leader, the Democratic Unionist Party, the DUP, which became the biggest unionist party in Northern Ireland. He became its leader a couple of years ago in a very fractious uh, series. Actually, there were two uh, leadership elections because his predecessor, a man called Edwin Poots, was only in the job for a matter of weeks. So the DUP is a very uh, divided party. And uh, now its leader, its interim leader, leader is Gavin Robinson, who is the MP for East Belfast. But certainly, uh, Geoffrey Donaldson, very, very well known, someone who has represented his Lacken Valley constituency, both for two separate parties and as an independent briefly uh, since 1997. So a very long serving MP in general. There are too many people within the House of Commons who've been there from 1997 or beyond, but Northern Ireland's longest serving MP. He's still an MP, of course. And the question will now uh, rise as to uh, as he's no suspended from the DUP, he's no longer leader of the DUP. The question will then be: Should he stand down as an MP? Of course, he's innocent until proven guilty. He has been charged, but what we don't know is whether he'll remain as an MP. Now, the uh, that's a very tight seat electorally for the Democratic Unionist Lagan Valley uh, constituency just outside Belfast. The main city there is Lisburn, and uh, the uh, there are various other parties which are uh, snapping at the heels of the DUP. Uh, and we'll see what happens, whether there's a by-election, although the question is, of course, we're going to have a general election fairly soon, and by-elections cost a lot of money to put on. So it'll be very interesting, both politically and in the wider context of the United Kingdom election, which may not happen until November, whether Geoffrey Donaldson remains a member of parliament. I would doubt very much whether he'll be seen around Westminster or even very much in his own constituency. Now, of course, uh, this is an active case since Mr Donaldson has been charged. But what has been the reaction so far from both Northern Ireland and in Westminster to this pretty shocking political news? Well, that's exactly the word that, that can be used, Alex. It's shock. Uh, nobody saw this coming. There were people... I, I, I was chatting to someone who was aware of uh, Geoffrey Donaldson being in America, actually, for the St Patrick's Day celebrations at the White House uh, and, and elsewhere, uh, just uh, on the 17th... They were in and around the 17th of March. And certainly that was... He was happy. He didn't seem to have uh, much of a care in the world, although obviously being a leader of a political party is, is usually quite a stressful job, and certainly in Northern Ireland and in the DUP. But this really came out of nowhere. It was overnight that uh, the social media accounts, including on X or Twitter, as it used to be called, of Jeffrey Donaldson were deleted. And then this morning, there were lots of questions rolling around on social media as to why that was the case. And then this bombshell that a 61-year-old man, uh, who is Mr Donaldson, and a 57-year-old woman have been arrested in regard to for uh, historic uh, sexual offences. And then, uh, at just about lunchtime, literally just, just over an hour ago, this statement from the party officers of the Democratic Union saying that uh, Jeffrey Donaldson had stood down as leader. He has been suspended from the party, which is if you have uh, proceedings against you, court proceedings against you, that is the case. That's what happens. And Gavin Robinson, who is an MP as well, he's the MP for East Belfast. He is now the interim leader of the DUP and they will have to have a leadership contest. But just absolute shock on both sides of the Irish Sea. Uh, you can imagine that very, very many people in Northern Ireland are talking about this. But certainly, Geoffrey Donaldson was something of an ally, uh, a, a difficult right. friend. Peter, stay, while, but... Peter stay, stay where you are. We'll bring you back in just a second. Joining us now uh, over there in Northern Ireland is journalist uh, Ken Murray. Uh, thank you for joining us, Ken. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, very, very shocking news. Uh, but politically, uh, with Geoffrey Donaldson out of the picture, how will that affect relations between uh, the DUP and Sinn Féin? Well, just for the record, uh, I'm actually in the Republic. I'm in County Meath, but uh, I, I worked quite a lot in Northern Ireland uh, in my years as a journalist. Um, it should be pointed out that when the Stormont Assembly uh, collapsed, um, there was immense resistance amongst the hardliners in the Democratic Unionist Party to return to Stormont and get the regional parliament up and running again, uh, because 2022 turned out to be a pivotal year in, if you like, the history of Northern Ireland, a number of things happened. First of all, Sinn Féin won the most seats uh, in the uh, Assembly election that year. The Irish Language Act uh, was passed. And one thing that happened that was a bit of an earthquake for unionists was that when the census figures were published uh, in late 2022, for the first time in something like 400 years, the number of Catholics in Northern Ireland surpassed the number of Protestants for the first time ever. So the hardliners in the pro-British Democratic Unionist Party 
put up resistance to re-entering the Stormont Parliament where uh, Michelle O'Neill of Sinn Féin was the first minister designate uh, at the time. And the hardliners did not want to go in because they kept making the point that the uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol, which was succeeded by the Windsor Framework, which is all part of the, the fallout from Brexit in 2016, it created a scenario whereby uh, Sinn Féin uh, were and are the dominant party in the Assembly, and some people felt uh, in the DUP that uh, Geoffrey Donaldson was going too far by cozying up to Sinn Féin and going back in. Now, uh, Geoffrey Donaldson did manage to persuade the majority uh, of the executive in the Democratic Unionist Party to restart the Stormont Assembly. And last month, uh, it reconvened, and Michelle Smith became the first minister, and her deputy is Emma Little Pengeli. Now, she's interesting because she holds, uh, if you like, a joint position, but the symbolism in Northern Ireland is that uh, nationalists, Catholics, even Sinn Féin that comes from a a Republican and anti-British background, they are now the dominant party. But Emma Little Pengeli is interesting because she doesn't have a mandate. So she holds this position without a mandate. And now that Geoffrey Donaldson has stepped down from the, the DUP, Gavin Robinson has taken over, it's going to be interesting to see if the hardliners in the DUP who oppose sharing the Stormont Assembly with Sinn Féin will make a move to, if you like, usurp the leadership position. There's speculation about Sammy Wilson, speculation um, about Edwin Poots or Ian Paisley Jr. They are totally opposed to sharing power with Sinn Féin uh, in the Stormont Assembly, but it seems they've gone along with it. And so far, the arrangement between Michelle O'Neill of Sinn Féin and Emma Little Pengeli of the DUP, it seems to be working out OK. But this development today uh, could throw a spanner in the works, to, to use a phrase, because as, as Peter referred to earlier on, there may be a by-election in the coming months. Maybe the DUP will hold out for the general election, which is coming down the line. And uh, there's likely to be some turbulence within the DUP in relation to how it moves forward working with Sinn Féin. So we're in a sort of a a wait and see mode at this moment yeah. in time. Yeah. Yeah, Peter, crossing back to you now. Again, there's very little we can talk around this subject, but uh, given some of the reports that are out there, reading some of the newspapers uh, online uh, in Belfast, the nature of the allegations are pretty severe. One could suggest that uh, to get to the passing the threshold of being charged is uh, quite a dramatic thing, especially for a man of his position. And the immediacy of his resignation, this isn't going to be a small matter, is it? No, it's not. We'll know when the charges come before the court on the 24th of April what happens. But certainly uh, in regard to the sensitivity of this and the high profile of Mr. Donaldson, in theory, everyone is equal before the law. And that is, of course, what the police would contend. But in reality, they're going to have to have made a very, very uh, deep uh, uh, look into this. Lots of inquiries before making the decision both to arrest and charge Mr. Donaldson. Now, it's interesting as well in the context that Ken talks about of the Northern Ireland Assembly. It is certainly fragile. Uh, it only got back uh, after two years of being suspended a short time ago. And for the DUP itself, it'll be very interesting to see where they go politically with this because Geoffrey Donaldson's political career appears to be in tatters today. Uh, Ken, let's bring you back in. Uh, you, you've worked around the Northern Ireland political scene for a fair few years. Uh, did you know uh, Geoffrey Donaldson? I'm assuming you did. What kind of a guy was, it, was he, how, or is he? How did you find him to work with? Well, as you can appreciate, uh, I, I'm based in Dublin. I used to work for the BBC in Belfast uh, and Ulster Television. I've done a lot of work with Euronews. So I've been up and down to Belfast a lot. I only got to know Geoffrey Donaldson uh, at a distance, you know, as Peter would would be familiar with, it's the, the old story of the, the scrum, the doorstep. Somebody walks out a door and you place a microphone uh, in front of them. But Jeffrey Donaldson always struck me as being very conservative. He's a member of the Presbyterian Church, very much of the DUP mould. If you understand the history of the DUP, it was founded in 1971, I think it was, uh, by the Reverend Ian Paisley, member of the Free Presbyterian Church. And when Ian Paisley did the deal at St Andrews in Scotland, I think it was 2007, to finally go into government with Sinn Féin, 
the the enemy that he tried to smash for so long. Uh, members of the DUP who are very religious, uh, very hardline, very anti Sinn Féin, very pro-British, loyal to the, the Crown in London, uh, they turned on Ian Paisley. They, they dumped him from his role as leader of the DUP. Uh, he was ousted from... Uh, his leadership of the Free Presbyterian Church. And Jeffrey Donaldson has been very much part of that mould. A member of the Free Presbyterian Church, he holds the title, I think he's a right honourable member of the Parliament in, in Westminster. That makes him a member of the Privy Council, which is the advisory body to the Crown. So for a man who's been very conservative and has held the line in terms of, you know, his Britishness and you know, staunch defence of Northern Ireland's position within the United Kingdom. This is a major embarrassment for him because the DUP, certainly the likes of Geoffrey Donaldson and his predecessors have always been, you know, promoters of morals. I'm sure Peter has many a story of where the DUP would oppose any events happening on a Sunday because it breached, you know, the Sabbath, and uh, he would be very much of that mould. This is a major embarrassment for him and a major embarrassment for the Democratic Unionist Party. Yeah, that is clear. Yeah, uh, Peter, uh, you, you've obviously, I detect from your accent, you might be from that part of the world. You must have uh, bumped into uh, Geoffrey Donaldson a few times. How did you find him as a guy? Yeah, many, many times I interviewed him as a journalist, but I also negotiated with him. I worked at the Northern Ireland office as a special advisor for about a year and a half to uh, two secretaries of state. So I came in contact with Jeffrey Donaldson quite a lot. I agree with Ken in that he is quite a conservative person, but he's fairly softly spoken, pragmatic, I would say. Uh, and also when he's trying to hold, as leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, trying to hold his party together, very, very, uh, it's a very, very difficult job. Now, the DP and even the hardliners, I, I probably respectfully disagree with Ken. I don't think they're opposed to power sharing per se. We've seen people like Sammy Wilson, even hardliners, who've been executive ministers. But at the same time, there were lots and lots of problems over the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol, the Windsor framework that was brought back in, uh, was brought to being, was negotiated by Rishi Sunak about a year ago. And really, Geoffrey Donaldson took a real leap of faith uh, constitutionally and politically in regard uh, to that, to getting back into government with Sinn Féin, although it wasn't actually at this stage anyway a government that he was part of because he retained being a member of parliament in in, uh, in Westminster. And that's something that Geoffrey Donaldson, who's been a member of parliament since 1997, although concurrently was a member of the Northern Ireland Assembly, he was a junior minister as well to Ian Paisley. So he held all sorts of titles over the, uh, over the nature of his political career, which I think we can now safely say is over. Um, and within that, a, a massive figure within Northern Ireland politics. Certainly when I met him, knew him, very affable, a very friendly person, uh, not someone who would uh, suffer fools gladly, but then many uh, unionist politicians and many politicians in Northern Ireland more generally are like that. But I always found him generally straightforward and a man of his word anytime I negotiated with him or dealt with him as a journalist and generally uh, perhaps a bit of a sense of humour as well, so uh, which you don't always get with politicians in Northern Ireland. So uh, it will be, politics in Northern Ireland will not be the same without Geoffrey Donaldson in it. He's been around it and a major, major figure in it for many, many years. And this is, you know, the DUP and I would say unionism in general is in crisis today as a result of this story and this series of events. Thank you, Peter, and thank you very much to Ken Murray. Uh, we should stress, of course, uh, Mr Donaldson or Sir Geoffrey is only charged uh, and uh, will be innocent until and unless he is proved guilty. Uh, over to you, Alex. Now, coming up after the break, pressure mounts on Deputy Labour leader Angela Rayner as Stockport Council launches a probe into her council tax affairs. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. 
Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <is it? laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. I'm Alex Phillips, and this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, the pressure is rising for Deputy Labour leader Angela Rayner as Stockport Council announces a review into suggestions the Labour deputy committed tax fraud. The council is looking into whether Rayner claimed the single person's council discount on the property while letting her brother live there. Well, it comes as Greater Manchester Police said it was reassessing its decision not to investigate alleg allegations Rayner avoided capital gains tax when she sold her former council house. She's also faced scrutiny over claims that in 2010 she may have lived primarily at her ex-husband's home, despite registr registering to vote under her own address, which could be a breach of electoral rules. Well, joining us now is the Telegraph columnist and parliamentary sketch writer Madeleine Grant and the Independence Chief Political Commentator. John Rentoul. Madeline, I'm going to start with you. I mean, on the surface of it, people can go, well, you know, she owned a house, her husband owned a house. Which one did she live in? Or is it just a mistake of paperwork? A lot of people do this sort of thing. But actually, when you're a deputy leader of a political party and the sort of uh, basket of uh, crimes and wrongdoings that this uh, could entail, it is quite serious. Well, I think that the real problem is, you know, as you say, we're not potentially looking at a very large sum of money here if these allegations are true. But I think as ever with these things, it's like it's the handling of the issue and essentially the sense of a cover up around it that has been the real problem. You know, I think that if Angela Rayner had said from the start, look, I made a mistake, I'm attempting to redress it. Um, you know, people often fall foul of the, the our tax system is notoriously complex. I mean, I have to hire an accountant just to deal with the tax return on the small amount of money that I make on top of my overall salary because it's so complicated. I, I think people would understand that. But there's been a real lack of reticence about this, about the issue of the house in Stockport. Um, and there are also big allegations of hypocrisy here because, you know, An Angela Rayner has previously been someone who's called for maximum transparency, called for people to resign uh, for having fallen foul of tax rules, for example. So she said that um, the 
during the Hartlepool by-election, she said that the Tory candidate, Jill Mortimer, she insinuated that she had links to Cayman Islands tax avoidance schemes and demanded that Mortimer publish her tax return, even though that she was just a lowly backbencher at the time. And, and of course, Keir Starmer himself has said that his top three, him, which would be him and Rachel Reeves and Angela Rayner, ought to uh, publish their tax returns. So there's all this stuff baggage from the past that is now coming to catch up with them. And I think, you know, if they had handled it differently, we wouldn't have to be in this place at all. The story would have gone away. Um, and I think in a way it shows that sort of arrogance within the Labour Party right now, they, they clearly think that, you know, you can do the nothing to see here, folks, just ride it out because, you know, that's how well they're doing in the polls. Uh, let's bring you in, uh, John. As I understand it, uh, 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 Angela Rayner says that she was... She was only acting on uh, proper legal advice about capital gains tax and maybe also uh, potential electoral fraud, which is a much uh, lesser uh, allegation. Uh, a lot of people make that mistake. Uh, but in terms of her capital gains, she says she was given proper advice. So no one is actually asking her to publish her tax returns. What we're asking, or what many they people... Are well, they're asking, show us that letter, that official advice you got about capital gains tax. Why doesn't she show us that? You know, she, uh, well, as Madeline pointed out, she's she's promised to publish her tax return, or, or Keir Starmer's promised it on her behalf, and she will do. <laughs> uh, she'll no doubt do that. But um, this, this is something that happened, what is it, 15 years ago or something like that. Um, uh, but she, as you say, she says she has advice from her either her lawyers or her tax advisors, not quite sure uh, which, um, which uh, satisfies her that she hasn't done anything wrong, but she won't show it to she won't show it to the rest of us. Um, she's shown it to Keir Starmer's team, but not to Keir Starmer himself. And I think that's a bit awkward. Yeah, I mean, how much of a headache, John, do you think this is going to be for Labour? Is it the sort of thing that the public just sort of, you know, goes over most people's heads? Or do you think people out there will have a sense of anger about this? Not, no, not much. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I, I love Angela Rayner. I think she's, I think she's brilliant. I think she's a great um, asset to the Labour Party. Uh, but she really shouldn't be behaving uh, in this hypocritical way. I mean, as Madeleine said, she has called on... Uh, various Tories at various times to be open and uh, and honest and to publish everything. And yet she's not following that uh, that herself. Uh, I think she'll get away with it because she's relatively popular and Labour are 20 points ahead in the polls. But I think it's a disgrace. Uh, well said, John. Uh, Madeline, uh, I mean, she won't get away with it because the, if the police, who have said they're reassessing their decision uh, not to investigate her, if they do investigate her and they find her guilty of this, of course... I must stress, she denies any wrongdoing. But if they find her guilty of uh, tax avoidance, uh, then she's in big trouble, isn't she? And uh, the Labour Party might have to dispense with her services going forward towards this election. Uh, I mean, she's, she's in a bit of a mess, isn't she? Yeah, I, I, th I, think, I think that's probably right. I think it would become too much, too much of a difficulty for Keir Starmer, popular as she is, if it were to be... Um, you know, there was some kind of official penalty um, given against her. But I just think that it's, you know, that what it tells you about the way that the Labour Party are operating, operating internally right now. Um, you know, it's not it's not actually, I, I think the question isn't so much like, will it register with voters? And, you know, is it going to make that big of a difference? I don't think it's that big of an issue, really. But it does tell you something important about how they are operating and what they feel they can get away with, because... You know, they're really riding so high at the moment. Um, you know, I think it's a bit... Obviously, this is nowhere near as serious as the fallout from the um, the selection of the anti-Semitic candidate in Rochdale. But there again, we had a situation where Labour were quite slow to react. And their I think that their first instinct was to kind of um, do go for damage control and hope you could ride it out rather than dealing with the problem there and then and of course in doing so it ended up being a much big creating you know quite the rod for their own backs there so I think perhaps that's the more important thing but yeah I think you're right I think if there was some official penalty she would then be too much of a liability perhaps the questions just wouldn't stop. Now, while we've still got you, Madeline, very quick question before we let you go. There have been some rumours knocking about that the Prime Minister could be forced into calling a general election this summer. Do you think that's likely or do you think it will be autumn? 
Oh, um, well, I, I don't know about those rumours, I'm afraid. I'm always a bit useless at these sorts of questions because I mostly just <laughs> kind of make fun of politics rather than sort of knowing all the internal gossip. But um, I think that my gut would be still October, November as before. Um, you know, I don't... With the polls as it is, it would take a very, uh, very brave um, party to go to the polls any sooner than, than that, I think. And then perhaps there is still the expectation that there may be some progress in areas. But, you know, we're currently in a technical recession. I don't think this would be a very good time for them to go to the polls. But that's just my hunch. I'm not sure there's any good time for the Tories to go to the polls at the moment. John, last <laughs> yeah. question to you. Uh, do you think uh, Angela will be uh, making a big public thank you to uh, Margaret Thatcher for profiting to the tune of more than £40,000 from Ma Maggie's uh, right to buy scheme? Do you think uh, Angela might thank Maggie? Well, no, I don't think she will, <laughs> surprisingly enough. I mean, she has said, I mean, to be fair to her, that she opposes uh, the deep discounts that, that are currently on offer uh, to right, right to buy tenants, you know, 60% or, or something like that, which, you know, and, and the proceeds cannot be reinvested in social housing. She says that's wrong. Uh, but no, I think uh, I, I think she takes a very pragmatic view, and I think that's one of the attractive things about her. Actually, she's prepared to praise uh, praise Tony Blair even when she was uh, sh she was uh, being lauded by the uh, the Corbynistas. Mm. Uh, and I suspect she probably would have some nice things to say about uh, Margaret Thatcher's record. Although I can't quite think that uh, she could bring herself to say that uh, the right to buy was. Uh, was an excellent idea. Uh, I'll, bet she, I'll bet she can't. I mean, she's got herself in a murky situation and it would benefit from the oxygen of transparency and that's what she needs to do. Thank you very much to John Rental and to Madeleine Grant. Uh, moving on now, the CEO of, the Thames, of Thames Water has said bills will have to rise by 40% if the company is going to survive. It comes as the business faces more than £15 billion worth of debt, made worse by the withdrawal of a £500 million funding injection from shareholders. But regulator Offwatt has made it clear it will refuse to budge on price hikes, leaving the cash-strapped water supplier in a slippery situation. Well, some suggest it is only a matter of time before the government is forced to take control. Joining us is journalist and author Ross Clark. Ross, nationalisation is a pretty costly pursuit for any government, particularly for a company as large as uh, Thames Water, which I believe supplies one in four households uh, with the transparent stuff. Um, but are they going to have any other option if they can't put up customer prices? Um, well, if the company ends up going bust, um, I don't see what option the... Uh government would have otherwise because um you know it, it is it is london's water supply this is a company which was originally sort of set up to take ownership of london's water infrastructure um if it goes bust you can't just suddenly switch onto some other company's pipe so um the infrastructure would have to be uh taken over by a sort of public corporation and um you know, whether it was then sold to some other private company or kept in public ownership, um, well, I can only guess. But, um, you know, I, I think there would not be very much enthusiasm for selling um, these assets to any other private operator, given the record that the privatised utilities have. Um, you know, they were privatised in the sort of 1980s, early 90s, with the promise that it would... Um, a better deal for taxpayers, customers, take taxpayers off the hook. It would um, create competition. It would um, raise new extra finance for building infrastructure. And, well, you look at it now, and it's from the electricity, gas industry. The prices have ended up being fixed by off-gem. Um, water, if you're a retail customer, there's no competition whatsoever. You just have to put up with Thames Water or wherever you are in the country. And, um, you know, the taxpayer doesn't seem to be off the hook either. I mean, look what's happened on the railways. They're swallowing more um, public subsidies than British Rail ever did. And the whole thing's been a sort of bit of a failure, really. And um, But sadly, the Conservatives just can't seem to bring themselves to admit it. It's um, privatisation, such a sort of totemic policy for, for many of them that they um, they seem to sort of carry on sort of um, pushing it even when um, the rest of the vast majority of the country seem to sort of um, think it's uh, not been such a great idea.
Uh, I mean, I would suggest that probably at the root of all this, of what's gone wrong, I mean, it's bad management generally, but uh, certainly the people running these water companies, not just Thames, but other dubious water companies as well, it's just greed. I mean, they've just been bleeding uh, these companies dry for their own purposes. Uh, but uh, do you really think, Ross, that nationalisation is the answer? Because I'm very dubious about that as a solution to anything. Nationalisation doesn't work. Uh, is, is that the way forward, though? I, I mean, I'm very pragmatic about these things. I, I don't have an ideology about privatisation or nationalisation. Um, but where things are not working, then, um, you know, you, you should you should consider changing yeah. them. And I mean, on the railways, I think Labour have a perfectly sensible policy, which is um, let these uh, franchises expire and then just transfer them into um, some kind of public ownership where, you know, we have a sort of one rail system. Um, not not this sort of bits and pieces and um, yeah, but the thing is, Ross, a whippersnapper like you, as a whippersnapper like you, you don't remember British Rail, but maybe you do. I do remember well, British Rail. I even worked for British well, Rail. There you go. Yeah, well, you that are. was a disaster. So nationalise the railways, <laughs> really? No, I mean, no, I said I, I, I work for British Rail. I, I have no, um, you know, uh, no romantic image of British Rail at all. Um, but, uh, you know, we don't have to recreate British Rail. We can, but you know, w w we do need to solve the, the problems which, which the sort of privatisation of railways has created and privatisation of other utilities has created. I mean, regards the railways, we've got this sort of a system where... Um, you know the um <laughs> you know well, they're supposed to stop strikes weren't they you know that was one of the big reasons <laughs> <How's that> for <laughs> privatization replacing the railway and they're on strike every week they've just sort of bid up their pay the unions have bid up their workers pay to astronomical levels far far more than it was under british rail yeah. and the government just keeps on bailing out these companies and i say no it gets a stage where you know, if they can't um, operate their franchises properly, they hand them back and um, or go bust, and then we take the infrastructure back from it. Of course, the rail, the um, the rails themselves already are back in public ownership because rail track was such a disaster, and we had, you know, all those sort of maintenance issues that trains kept falling off the rails because the rails weren't maintained properly, so they had to be taken back into a you know, umbrella organisation. And um, I think, no, it's, it's you've got to be pragmatic. I, I don't want the sort of government to go out and buy up every water company because it would be fantastically expensive. And in some parts of the country, it wouldn't be necessary. But where we've got Thames Water, um, you think, you look at all that sort of wonderful water industry infrastructure, all the reservoirs and all the... Um, pumping stations, the sewers and so on. And they were all sort of built prior to um, privatisation. And But un under privatisation, these companies have just sort of decided to sweat their assets while um, handing large um, uh, dividends to their private equity owners and then piling the companies with debt and then you know, on the basis, well, of course, you know, government eventually cannot in ultimately let these companies go bust. So we, we've got this sort of system where it's it's capitalism when things are going good, well and when they're awarding themselves pay and um, bonuses. And it's suddenly socialism when things go badly and they expect to be bailed out by the taxpayer. But this is a pattern we've seen repeated across a number of industries and a catalogue of failures and focusing back on water, essentially, as well as the big bosses' salaries and their bonuses, despite driving their companies into severe amounts of debt. We've had hosepipe bans alongside loads of water leaks everywhere, all yeah. around the place. And then the, the worst, I think, recent, you know, in, in the public's mind is this dumping of effluent in rivers and seas. I mean, where, I mean, if the buck doesn't stop with the big boss who still gets a bonus, what? What's going on? I, I know it, and you know they've chosen to, uh, uh, you know, rather than sort of charging uh, properly for the the product, they've decided to sort of ration it through hosepipe bans rather than building reservoirs, investing in new infrastructure. I mean, Thames Water 
built a desalination plant. So they did put some money into the system, but then come a drought and they decided not to use it. They decided <laughs> it would be too expensive to use it. Completely ridiculous. Now, the, the, the sewage problem, well, that does actually go back to Victorian times because although, you know, there's very impressive engineering went on 19th century, the engineers did make this fatal error of combining the foul drains, which, you know, empty lavatories and things, with the storm drains where the water running off the streets in periods of high rainfall, the drain that way. Now, you combine those two systems, and what happens is that um, when um, rainfall gets so heavy, um, sometimes the water, the drains have to bypass the sewage yeah. treatment works. Mm -hmm. And that's where you re release a load of water into the river. And of course, it's full of sewage as well. Which and is it, disgusting. It was disgusting. We need to do something about that. Ross, uh, great to talk to you. Thank you Thanks, so Ross. much for your time. Ross Clark there. Now, coming up after the break, as the licence fee rises, the BBC is set to slash more than 100 hours worth of programming. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart screen. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kingston City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, the BBC is set to slash 100 hours worth of programming in the coming year, while the licence fee continues to rise. 
With the BBC projecting a total deficit of almost £500 million, there will be a sharp decrease in new dramas, soaps and documentaries, with daytime favourites Doctors already axed. Uh, joining us now is media commentator Nigel Pauly. Yeah. Hi, Nigel. Um, if I gave you the task, if I gave you the task uh, of, uh, yeah, I said, right, you've got three... Point five billion pounds, three and a half billion pounds to spend in the next year. Uh, you wouldn't be able to do it. But if you wanted handy advice on how to get rid of all that money and then still plead poverty, you must go to the BBC. They know how to do this. How dare this state broadcaster that we have to pay for, soon to the tune of £170 a year, tell us they haven't got enough money when we corporately give them three and a half billion quid a year, and now they're going to cut back 100 hours worth of programming, including top quality drama, the uh, daytime soap doctors getting uh, axed, CBBBs, uh, they're, get, they're going down, whatever you call it, uh, and so on and so forth. So factual entertainment shows are going down uh, to 850 hours. Uh, that's a cut slash of 15%. Basically, they are completely cutting back the, the amount of entertainment they give us because they say they haven't got enough money. They're swimming in money, aren't they? They are, and they also, rather annoyingly, are cutting all the things that I actually quite like watching on the BBC. Great, uh, BBC Four, where they used to have great uh, music documentaries and live uh, and, and, and arty sort of stuff. Uh, sport, they're cutting back on as well. They haven't actually mentioned too much of that, but what they, what actually is worse than you're saying, Kevin, because they cut a thousand, they, they cut a thousand hours last year. So they're actually just adding on. Uh, last year, they cut back on sport, they cut back on various dramas, but they're cutting back even further. So we're actually worse than we were a year ago, and we're going to be even worse than we were two years ago. So it's an ongoing drip, drip, drip of cutting. CBeebies, why? I mean, surely kids point. want to watch television. Why, why should the future of broadcast... Let's face it, they, they, they're, they're used to obsessed at the BBC, but they're cutting CBeebies. It doesn't make any sense. Does it? If you'd have thought... Yeah. That would have been the audience they wanted to capture. Well, this that's is, what they, yeah, they tend to do. This is what I don't understand, because they get a licence fee as the public service broadcaster. And if I was going to categorise what is the public service and what isn't, I would say big sporting events that everyone should be able to access for free, gone. I would say yes. rolling national news, gone. gone. I would say local services, such as gone. local radio, gone. I would say children and education programmes, gone. gone. Instead, what are we getting? Foreign language drivel in other countries and blimmin' hundreds of podcasts. And inaccurate well, news. <laughs> but podcasts are, are uh, the big thing. Someone yeah. said the other day that the um, the trouble with the BBC is that, you know, they're, gonna, they're, they're going into AI. It's going to be even worse. We're going to have programmes that are not going to be made, but it's going to be AI. Yeah. AI. Yeah. They are enthralled to big tech and high tech. Now, we all know that big tech, high tech costs a lot of money. And rather than in competing in that world, the BBC have headed straight into the digital world while well, they've left behind us, I guess they're called analog viewers behind. Yeah. But the basic thing is, we're the ones who pay their wages. Yeah. I would quite like to see the open golf back on yeah. the television. Oh, me too, oh. Nigel. We've got to go, but I'll tell you, the BBC is not like it was in our day. It's going uh, to hell in a hand. Nothing's God. like it. Thanks, was. Nigel Pauly. Sadly, though, Alex, we've come to the end of this very special Good Friday show. Thank you for tuning in. Please do join us same time, actually, on Monday at 9:30 a.m. Yeah, up next, though, is Ian Collins. Have a wonderful Good Friday. Bye-bye. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. <laughs> this helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet's office. <laughs>
JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. It's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> 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 <laughs>